welcome to another episode of ST Talks. I'm Laura Demmer, your host, and today I'm here with Scott Umbel and Casey Anderson, two members of ST Genetics technical team. So first off, thank you both for joining us today. You bet. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Laura. On this episode, we will be talking about creating and marketing beef cross calves. As we all know, creating the correct number of replacement females is essential in today's dairy market. And creating these from your higher genetic end of your herd is crucial for progress. So the breeding model that many have adapted is to breed their bottom end to beef in order to capitalize on the beef cross calves. I think where we start today is kind of the how, how do we do this? So how do producers select the best beef bull for this terminal cross? Um, kind of an important selection criteria is to meet the goals of the market that you're in. For example, we have we have numerous dairies that are that are just selling these calves at day old. So the important thing that we need to focus on there is is fertility is is always going to be the number one driving factor. Um, working with a company such as ST um, and our internal teams, uh, we have a good good bearing on what bulls provide the best fertility portion of it. When you get into another sector. Um, importance is working with kind of strategic partners that they're going to have some criteria for specific beef bulls lining up for the end goals, um, such as what the packers want, the consumers want. Um, So focus on fertility, focus on what market those calves are going into. And then a different subset is people that are raising these calves start to finish. Um, We're providing kind of some some cutting edge technology within the ST platform, but just being cognizant of what you want to do with those calves, how you want to make the extra money as you're breeding the bottom of your dairy herd to these uh, specific beef sires. Sure. I think another thing to add on to that too is it depends, first of all, what breed that that herd is milking. So there's a big piece of it too. The jerseys don't always get mated to the same thing as Holsteins. Then what we focus on mostly just because the predominant breed in the U.S. is Holstein. And by and large, the beef breed that's getting used most for beef on dairy is the Angus. Looking at the Angus Holstein cross, there's I think there's going to be a couple schools of thought that come out of this that Casey and I talk about from time to time. Some of us are trying to get the perfect amount of ribeye marbling um, fat percent all lined up exactly. And then some of the rest of us are just in the boat of we might just need to make the biggest, beefiest, shortest animal that matches the native cattle as much as we can out of a a tall angular Holstein. And so maybe as this industry goes on, we'll we'll probably see which side of that wins outright. But a lot of different things that we're looking at on that side. Right. And well, Casey, as you have mentioned, beef go through numerous hands before they actually get processed. And then Casey, kind of what you're talking about, like creating a uniform animal, um, I think is really important too. So are there some universal traits that uh, producers should be selecting for that, you know, each background or feeder and packer is selecting for, or I guess, is wanting when they get the animal? There are. So, so one thing we got to keep in mind too, is the, 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 the beef numbers that come down to how the beef gauge their EPDs versus native beef cattle um, don't always correlate into the beef, the, the beef on dairy market, meaning some, some beef animals might possess really, really high numbers, but the transmission of genes aren't there. But if we have to just kind of take a very, you know, line in the sand approach here. We do, we do want to have a little bit of focus on, on calving ease into there, making sure that calf comes out of there, not overcompensate for calving ease, but just to make sure that that calf is going to come out there in a reasonable way, um, um, get good weaning weights and yearling weights on those, on those bulls. Um, and as Scott mentioned there, the marbling and ribeye of, of that specific to the ribeye, that is the one area that we do want to get a focus on a little bit better shape, kind of bring that Holstein roundness out of there and get a little bit more comparable um, to the native beef population. So other than those traits um, and that, you know, producers should be selecting or should be looking at when looking at a beef sire, are there other ways to capture more value in the beef cross calf? Sure. I mean, the first thing that I think of, given that we're ST genetics, is we're getting more and more data back about the value of a steer crossbred versus the value of a heifer. Um, plain and simple, just in that that backgrounding phase, we think there's probably a hundred to one hundred fifty dollars more in the day, the average daily gain and the feed conversion on a steer versus a heifer calf, Angus on Holstein. 
So with the capability of sexed beef, especially if you are going to raise these out to finish, there's even more there. Or if you have a direct partnership with a calf buyer or a backgrounder or a wean lot, starting with putting some sex semen on your bottom end cows that aren't going to make dairy replacements, right? There's an easy way for well less of an input than the output on those animals that you can make up that difference pretty well for your overall operation. Yeah, I think that um, anytime that the sex male semen uh, for beef can be used on dairy, that that's instantly going to see um, an increase or a um, benefit to your bottom line. So how is the beef add-on program from ST Genetics different from other beef on dairy offerings out there? Laura, where we're kind of strategically positioning within the ST platform is is not only to find the right sire lineups, um, given that the entire Angus breed is is kind of descendant from five different Angus sires. If you look back 20 years, um, a lot of our competitors, a lot of people out there can have the same sort of of gene makeup what we're doing different at st is really really taking a strong technology driven focus with this specifically developing our eco feed technology so to put it as simply as we possibly can eco feed is a feed measurement when an animal gets put in a pen of what it's expected to eat and what it actually does eat within that subset we get animals that are fast efficient gainers that eat less feed than the contemporaries and we also get animals that eat a large quantity of feed and do not gain as, as much. Um, doing this is a very, very expensive and timely process. ST has the focus of many years driven behind it. What we're trying to develop is a win-win for all of the scenarios. We want a dairyman to be able to know that their cows can be marketed to numerous outlets. We want the feedlots to consider themselves very, very uh, appreciative and and have a nice structure around them of the animals that they're getting in. We are going to give them a tailor-made plan to how to feed those animals. And at the end of the day, we need to have the kind of end consumer in mind of when they go into the packing plants, the packing plants know that they'll have a consumer driven focus into there. So from the ST specific side of things, it's going to be research and development that's guiding this with a specific focus to enhance genomic testing on these beef dairy crosses to give us an indication of what we want to do with these animals at 30 days of age, um, moving them forward to give peace of mind to every link in this chain that's out there. Yeah, that's well said. I think too, another piece of it, ST has been much more on the side of, like Casey said, the the expensive uh, trials and progressions that we've had on our gross safe with recording the actual pounds of intake versus expected intake. Um, a lot of the competition has simply simply made their beef on dairy program theoretical. Uh, we had a former employee that essentially staked his career on the Angus times Holstein index and their numbers. And granted, there's probably some correlation there with the finished product, but how do we know? ST has really taken undertaken the approach of getting lots and lots of hot carcass data back, comparing it back to the initial sire, the lineage, what the genetic profile of that animal was, and we're getting the empirical data back in mass quantity to really know not what in theory should work, but in reality has worked and will continue to work. That's fantastic. So essentially, the beef add-on program creates a, a form of traceability, which I I think uh, most consumers in today's world wants to know where their where their food is coming from. So it creates, um, it kind of fills that bucket as well as the bucket of sustainability um, on the on the dairy farm as well, um, which are two buckets that I think a lot of consumers are very interested about um, today. Sure. I mean, even in Washington state, one of our employees showed me an app where certain restaurants, you can scan the QR code that comes out with your steak and it will tell you the life history of that animal. So that maybe is many years off, but that is already a reality in our country in certain locations. The closer we are to establishing that from the grassroots, the whole way up to the dinner plate, further ahead will be with where the consumers want this process to be. That's awesome. I mean, that's a lot of technology and I think ST is at the forefront of that. So that's fantastic. Um, so Casey, you had touched on this prior stating that the majority of Holstein herds are selecting Angus. For a Holstein herd, do you think Angus is the most beneficial cross uh, or what, what would you guys say the most beneficial cross is as well as for a Jersey herd? 
You bet. It, it, it comes back to how you're, you're marketing those calves as well. Um, so the Holstein, the, the Angus is the Holstein breed of the beef world. Angus has the most data, can have the most kind of genomic reliability into there. We just have the most to work with. Um, when it comes down to what a farm should focus in on and what they're doing, if, if, if you're a dairyman that's just selling the calves open market to your neighbor or, or to a public auction or somewhere, um, that also brings into question the Sim Angus breed. Those, those animals tend to be a little bit larger, thicker frame calves at birth. Um, so it comes back to hitting in, in, into what market you're, you're settling in on. Um, I will say the focus um, at ST is Angus and the Sim Angus breed. Um, specific back to the Jersey market, you know, we're very supportive of, of the Charlet breed coming into there for multi reasons. Um, the biggest two are is when you have a crossbred Jersey herd, we see a lot of Holstein Jersey herds um, evolving today just because of the, the benefits of that F1 cross. Where, where confusion comes in is in the maternity areas. You know, the workers are, are dealing with all solid black calves. And, and today it's really just checking if the animal's pulled or not to find the difference. In the Charlet portion, it makes a nice smoky gray calf, which is instant identification. And that's a beef animal. The darker colored animals are there. Um, also, it, it brings up some of the fine boneness over dairy quality traits of, of the Jersey. The Jerseys are a unique breed that their maternal traits allow them to kind of calve in numerous different breeds in regards to Charlet and Limousine very effectively. So it takes that negative birth weight connotation out of there. That's a lot of good information on a numerous um, or a handful of different breeds. Um, and I think just one last point I want to talk about before we wrap this up is uh, prior when you talked about EcoFeed and just the beef add-on program, you had said that we want to start utilizing or um, using the genomic information on these beef cross calves. What type of genomic data or results can producers expect to receive if they do start genomic testing these individuals? You bet. As ST evolves and this genomic test becomes commercially available, once we have enough data points to, to, to really make this, this stick in the real world, um, what we're looking at is the ability to find out after the genomics are, are, are in, we can tell if this animal is going to be an efficient eating animal and a fast gaining animal. A uh, slow gaining animal and and a, but efficient at there. What you would do different is the penning strategy um, within that. Some of the other traits we're we're looking to add into there is we're monitoring health traits. So we're seeing if there's a genetic effect in pneumonia, scours, um, any sort of resistance in the BVD portion, um, liver abscesses. We're trying to establish that at a uh, genetic level. We're not convinced that it that it does have a lot to do with it, but we're always looking for the next thing. Um, we have seen a very high correlation in the marbling and ribeyes um, to the point that the numbers are, are quite staggering as we look at these, meaning when those genes are in line and they're inherited, they're, they're coming across at a very, very high rate, which is pleasant for us to know. Um, so as we, we look to the future, when we're looking at genomic testing, you know, ST's goal isn't to be the industry leader today. We're looking to lead the industry where it needs to be over the next five to 10 years. We want to be at the top of this. We want to come out with the next relevant set of data. Um, and we firmly believe in investing in that technology is where it's going. Yeah, and that data would be extremely impressive, especially when, um, you know, producers are trying to categorize these type of animals. But um, I just want to say thank you, Scott and Casey. I appreciate your time and knowledge on this immensely. You bet. Thanks for having us on. Thank you, Laura. This was another episode of ST Talks. You can find more of our episodes on any podcast platform. 